You may be seated. Lord, we thank you for this morning, and we thank you for the opportunity to offer these, um, these songs of praise. And as we um, take a moment now to take up an offering and to, um, to mark the abundance that you've given us and the, pr- the provision that you have, um, have shown us by giving back a little of what you've given, we recognize that all, what you, all that we have is from you. And so, God, we're thankful for the chance to be involved and to, um, to be a part of your work that you're doing in this place and um, at our, the church in Ocala, the church in Lakeland, by um, supporting the local church. And we thank you for the gift that it is uh, to be a part of it. And for, the, and for the means to support it, Lord, you've been so good to us as a church family, and we pray that you'd give us wisdom and, and guide us as we steward what you've given us. So help us to have joyful hearts as we give and um, continue to lead us through this time together. In Jesus' name.
Lord, we believe that you have a plan to work in and through us as your people. And as the closer we read in the Word, it's clear that your heart for us is that we would be, um, is that we would have a heart for others. That we would learn to see the people in our lives the way that you see the people in our lives. Um, that we would stop with the cultural norms of suspicion and of distrust and of hatred toward people that are different from us. Uh, that we would see people not as problems, but as people who are deeply loved by their Heavenly Father and who many are lost. So Lord, as we open up a, a section of Scripture this morning that, that speaks loud and clear about that, I pray, Father, that you would move in our hearts and that you would give us a heart for the people that maybe right now, if we're honest with ourselves, we don't have a heart for but you've put us here in this place and in, in, around those people for a purpose. But the first, the, ch the change has to start in us, and that's a change that only you can, only you can create, only you can give us, um, show us what it really means to love an enemy and to pray for those who persecute. And Lord, it's always an encouragement and a conviction that you did not just teach those words, but you practiced them. So moving our hearts this morning, we ask that um, you would remove the, the barriers that we've set up, the barriers the enemy has set up to hearing this message in our hearts, and that we would come to you willing to, willing to change, willing to hear, and willing to be commissioned and sent out to share it with others. You're so good. We thank you for this chance, this Sunday morning. Help us not to grow weary in doing good. Help us to always remember the blessing that it is to be together. And would you, would you help us to bear fruit? It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Um, last week, we started this series off called Living as Sacrifices, and that is from a, a familiar passage for many of us, right? From Romans chapter 12. And this is our key principle, sort of the distillation of that section, that Jesus' sacrifice should move us to a life of, serv of sacrificial service. Sort of my restating and summarizing what it says in Romans 12.1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. We talked about how, you know, Romans is a book that's split in half. There's uh, the first 11 chapters is a lot about salvation and God's mercy and God's love. So when Paul says, I, I urge you or I appeal to you on, on thinking about all of these things that God has done for you, what now? And the what now, the, the application he's about to lay out in the rest of the book that begins in chapter 12 is summarized in that statement, to lay down your life as a living sacrifice. So each week in this series, we intend to kind of start there and then jump off into another section of Scripture that talks about that idea of living as sacrifice, perhaps in a more practical and clear way. And so this morning, we're going to do that via Luke chapter 15. And Luke chapter 15 has three parables, three teachings of Jesus about a very specific issue that I kind of referred to in, in my prayer ahead of time, which was uh, seeking the lost. That's going to be the, 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 one of the, the set, sort of the second practical way that we live as sacrifice. The first way we talked about last week was really clearly service, right? The idea that each 
one of us as believers is to live our lives as servants of the kingdom of God in every aspect of our lives, and that includes serving the local church in formal ministry, but it does not only mean that, right? That we as believers are to put ourselves in the position that Jesus put himself of servant in all areas of our lives, and that's one of the ways, one of the things that Paul means by living his sacrifices, So this morning we get a little more specific, and in the next few weeks we're going to talk about uh, two other specific areas where that all plays out. And so the first one this week is seeking the lost. And this all plays out from a scene in Luke chapter 15 where Jesus has an interaction um, based on his own heart for the lost. It starts in chapter 15, verse 1. Read it with me. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So just two verses, right? But, but we have laid out here a couple of key people, key, key groups of people in the scene, um, the tax collectors and the sinners is the first group, um, which for us is a, that's a, a phrase you're only going to read in the Bible, right? We don't have those categories for people the same way that the uh, ancient uh, that the two people at the time of Jesus had. But who were the tax collectors and the sinners? Well, the tax collectors and sinners were uh, to the Pharisees and the scribes. It's sort of like two sides of the political spectrum. Right? Two sides of the religious spectrum, for certainly. These were two groups that could not get uh, along much. Uh, they, they couldn't get along at all. And um, they stood for different things. They lived different lives. The tax collectors were seen as people who had uh, sort of sold their soul to the Romans and to the, uh, to the powers that be. They were seen as traitors, to the national pride. So I don't know what kind of category that is for you. It depends on your generation, right? Of like how how like the, so, like global politics works, right? But like we've all, there's always this group of people, right? That's whether it's in news or in, you read the history books. Like these are the people that you just didn't want to be around. They were seen as traitors of the the national uh, the national uh, pride, right? Sinners. We have a better idea on sinners, right? We get the idea of this, right? These are people who are clearly walking in a way, have a moral lifestyle that is opposed to the teachings of Scripture. These are the, it's like the opposite of church people, right? Now, that doesn't mean there aren't sinners in church, but the point is these are people who are fine with living a life that is, that is identified with sin. I don't think we have a hard time coming up with a category for that, Right? But then there's this other group, the Pharisees and the scribes. And see, here's a problem with this passage. It's not a problem with the passage. It's a problem with how we read it. See, we're good Sunday school people, right? We're good Bible readers. And so we know when the Pharisees and the scribes come up that this means trouble, right? That whatever they're about to say, Jesus is probably going to disagree with them. Um, Because Jesus had a lot of problems with what the Pharisees and the scribes had to say. But here's the problem, right? The person that was hanging out with Jesus and in his ministry did not necessarily have that view of the Pharisees and the scribes. They were respected and revered people. This would be like if I said the elders and the Bible teachers, right? This would be like in a Baptist church, right? If you were in a Baptist church. How many of you have ever been to a Baptist church for any length of time, right? It would be like if you said it was the deacons and a traveling preacher, right? Somebody who really, really knows the Word of God and somebody who's in this position of respect and that is looked up to morally and from a religious perspective. They were highly respected. And so, what, so anyway, all of that to say... When, when they say, this man receives sinners and eats with them, there would have been a guy in the back pew saying, amen. Right? There would have been a, there would have been a, a question in the mind of the listener, the people who are witnessing this interaction. Yeah, isn't that funny? 
Hmm, because, see, the Pharisees and the scribes won't hang out with the tax collectors and sinners. And here's Jesus, this guy we all respect, this guy we all recognize his authority, teaches with authority, has a different kind of ministry, has, shows these, this, these signs and these wonders and this power from on, that clearly must be from God, right? And he's eating with the tax collectors and the sinners. What's going on here, Right? Whose side are we supposed to be on? Is Jesus wrong? Is Jesus watering down the message? Is Jesus uh, sort of towing the line of what should be acceptable behavior for somebody who wants to honor God? The Pharisees and scribes on to something here. This would have been the kinds of questions that the people who were gathered listening to this interaction would. We're already on the idea, though, as people who have read the end of the story, we're already on to the idea that the Pharisees and scribes have this wrong and that Jesus is right. But I think it's helpful to understand, right, and to apply this moment to our own lives and to our own hearts to realize the Pharisees and scribes and their concerns are concerns of religious people ever since the start of the church. It's the question that the church has had to ask every single generation. Are we supposed to hang out with tax collectors and sinners? <laughs> and to what degree? What does Jesus say? They grumble, and Jesus teaches. And so this is going to be the teaching, right? And this is what, I'm, so I'll start with where I, kind of the, 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 the summary statement. Part of living as sacrifices means giving our lives to Jesus' mission to seek and to save the lost. Jesus is about to give three teachings about his heart for what he calls a lost sheep, or what he uh, connects to as a lost coin, or um, the familiar story of a prodigal son. And so Jesus gives this teaching, these teachings that are very familiar to us, in the context of this little interaction, this question, this debate. Should we be hanging out with tax collectors and sinners or not? Should we be eating with them, having fellowship with them? The first parable, the first teaching is this, verse 3. He told them this parable, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. So I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 persons who need no repentance. Just the first teaching. But what I think we take away from this is that this message to the crowd, and I think his message to the Pharisees and scribes, because here's the thing, the Pharisees and scribes are lost sheep in the story too. His message to them is, you don't understand my heart for people who are apart from a relationship with me, that are lost from my sheepfold. And so Jesus, what is saying through this story, through this parable, is that is that heaven, and therefore God, and therefore Jesus, right, prioritizes lost sheep over the 99. And it's ever since we've learned this story in Sunday school, we've probably had to process this and think about this. Like, isn't that risky for the shepherd to leave the 99 in the open field and to go into seek the lost sheep? And that, of course, is the point of the story, right? That that, that that is the level to which Jesus prioritized the lost. He was willing to go to the cross, right, for them. He was willing to give up everything for them. So there's a lot of things we can take away from this story. When it comes to parables, it's very important that we keep the main thing the main thing. And I think that the main idea here is clearly 
the end, the statement at the end. Notice what, that it says, Rejoice with me, for they have found, have found my lost sheep uh, that was lost. And just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Um, verse 10, the end of the lost coin story, which we're about to read in a minute, ends a very similar way. After I get through the Roman stuff. Uh, just so I tell you, there is joy. It doesn't say in heaven, but it says before the angels. And where are the angels? Right? So, I mean, he said it's the same basic statement. There will be joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And that same sentiment, that same basic teaching is repeated at the end of the story of the prodigal son. So these three stories are really all teaching the same idea about God's love. That Jesus' Jesus' response to the naysaying Pharisees and scribes is to make a value statement about heaven. To make a value statement about the heart of God. And therefore, his heart as the one sent from the Father. We often... So here's the thing. It was a big day. And I remember my, my children's pastor used to talk about this all the time in the church I grew up in. It was a big day when you went from being lost to being found. He used to say, you know, the angels had a party when you accepted Jesus into your heart, right? And that's, that's a cool image for a little kid to hear, right? But that is, that's what he's saying. There's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 who don't need repentance. When Jesus uses shepherding language, he's, he's, he's grabbing on to a metaphor and an example that's used all throughout the scriptures, right? The idea of God as a shepherd and us as sheep. Um, Psalm 100 says it this way, Know that the Lord is God, it is he who made us. We are his. We are his people. It says, we are the sheep of his pasture. So his we, us belonging to him, starts, it says, with him having made us, since he made us. So you could say, well, isn't just Israel God's sheep? Isn't just, aren't just believers God's sheep? No, in Psalm 100, it says that we are his sheep because he made us, and he made all mankind, right? So we are all his sheep, every human, all seven plus billion of us. Jesus says, they're my sheep. Why? I made them. I knitted them together in their mother's womb. To call people sheep today is an insult, right? If you read somebody calling somebody a sheep online, it's them saying something offensive about them, right? We call people sheep when they're being, uh, when they're being misled or when they're not thinking well because sheep have a reputation for being dumb. Sheep aren't good at being alone, and that's why a lost sheep is such a big problem, Right? Because sheep are herd animals. They don't thrive well on their own. In fact, they are, they're, they're in serious danger if they're by themselves and without a shepherd. But for the ancient person, for God to say that you are the sheep of my pasture is a statement of two things. First of all, of God's affection. Because as we talked about a few weeks ago when we talked about the Passover lamb, right, a, a sheep was a treasured possession for an ancient person, especially somebody who was a shepherd. Their, it was their livelihood. You know, it was, but it was more than that because it was also, a, you know, there, there's something that, that requires a lot of attention and care. It's like the closest thing that you probably have in your life and in your house to that is, is a pet, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a dog or a cat or a you know, if you're a weirdo, a snake, or something like that, right? Uh, rodent. I mean, no judgment, but geez, you could find a better pet than that. But, <laughs> or, or perhaps better than that, right? Think about the bond that a working dog has with its handler, right? There's that same pet affection and love, but there's also a partnership, Right? And so that's the relationship of a shepherd to the sheep. So, so when God says, they're my sheep, he's making a statement of affection and compassion and love. And so a lost sheep, man, you ever lost your dog, right? 
Some of you have, have had a neighbor recently lose a pet, right? Then they put the, they, 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 there's this whole mourning and, and panic process, right, that people go into whenever a pet is lost. It's their whole focus of their, of their life until they can find that lost, lost pet. So that's the love side, but there's also a sin side to the story, right? Isaiah 53, 6 says, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. That goes to the, to, the, to the other side of the sheep illustration, that we, just like sheep, have a tendency to wander. He says, we have turned, he says, every one to his own way. The Lord has laid the iniquity of him, uh, uh, the, has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So because every life is deeply valued by the God who made him, them, he moves in action, to action, to protect when his sheep stray. He, he moves to action to find lost sheep. He prioritizes them. That Isaiah verse is sort of the Old Testament version of the verse in Romans that says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we all start our lives as lost sheep, right? Before we confess and believe, Right, what it talks about in Romans, that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Before that moment happens, the, the scriptures teach that we are lost sheep. And just like a shepherd leaves the 99, so God sends Jesus to seek and to save the lost. Remember, we talked about that back on Easter, that that was Jesus' mission, to seek and to save the lost. John 10 and 11 says, I am the good shepherd, Jesus says. I lay down my life for my sheep. So Jesus had a heart for lost sheep. They're the center of his rescue mission unto earth and his work on the cross. And they're still the center of his work in the world. And the crazy thing is, right, we have this Romans 10, 9 verse memorized because it's the end of the Romans road, right? So many of us have had this dedicated to memory our whole lives. But what's crazy is, is as you continue to read, you find that this is not just instructions on how to, how to pray a prayer right of salvation, but it's a, 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 it's, it is God deputizing each one of us to share this news and to share this good news about a shepherd and us being lost sheep to the lost sheep in our lives. As he goes on, he says, For the heart, "...with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved." For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how, and how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. All right, so our key principle Part of living as sacrifices is giving our lives to Jesus' mission to seek and to save the lost. Jesus is the one who seeks and saves the lost. It's not me. It's not Billy Graham, right? It's not your favorite evangelistic teacher. It's not that, it's not that friend that you have that does so great with personal evangelism, right? Jesus is the one who does it, but he deputizes his followers into his mission. He says, I want you to do this with me. Jesus prioritizes the law, so we should too, because how are they to respond unless they hear the message? How are they to know the truth if nobody ever tells it to them? See, because most people's understanding of God is not the one that was just described to us by the story of the 99 and the one lost sheep, is it? 
most pe- people's idea of what we believe as Christians. Most people's understanding of what, what the God of the Bible is not of that. It's a different kind of understanding. And so we have to be the ones, right, who understand this first. First, understand God's heart for us, which we have to be reminded of that as believers, don't we? Because we so quickly think that we, we've, we're the ones that found God, right? That, that we, we really bring something to the table of this sheepfold, then God's lucky to have us. And we forget that we all started as lost sheep. When we start to grab a hold of that, we start to grab a hold of God's love and patience and mercy and grace for us, right? We can start to look at those tax collectors and those sinners from a little bit different perspective. I believe that the reason that most of us, and I lump myself into this, don't seek the lost with the same heart and the same fervor and the same urgency that Jesus did and Jesus does is because we don't share Jesus' value system yet. We don't yet understand the value of every human life. We don't yet fully understand the value that Jesus places on lost sheep. I want to transition away from sheep and onto coins because that's what Jesus does. It's fascinating, right? He says in verse uh, 4, what man of them, but what, what man of you? And then in verse 8, he says, or what woman? So he gives uh, an illustration for both sides in their culture, right? Uh, and he says, what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and her neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Have you ever lost something of value? I think we all have done it at one time or another. You should think of that thing, right? Think of that story. Think of those moments, right, when you realize that it's missing. And there's that feeling in the pit of your stomach. I, uh, a few years ago, Meredith and I went to the beach, and we were uh, like a year or two, maybe max, into being married. And I was still getting used to wearing uh, a wedding ring. And actually, the story even goes back even further than that. When I was getting my, uh, my ring, my finger size for a wedding band, you know, uh, which most dudes have no idea what ring size they are, so they have to go, and somebody has to figure out what size you are, right? So I, I, I gave uh, the lady behind the, desk, behind the counter at Sebring Jeweler um, my right hand, and, um, and she didn't think anything of it. She probably should have asked me to switch hands. I didn't think anything of it, because I probably couldn't have even told you which side I was supposed to wear it on yet. But because I was like 19 at the time, but um, I, got, I, I found out after our wedding that my, uh, my one ring finger is apparently bigger than the other. And so it would have fit really great on the right finger, um, but on the left finger it was loose. And it still is a little bit loose. Um, it's not as loose as it used to be. I apparently added a little weight to that knuckle or something. Um, and, um, but anyway, it was loose. It was not loose enough for me to be like, I have to go get this fixed because I was also very young and broke and just newly married, and I knew that was probably going to cost money. And so I just lived with it, right? Um, but that meant that anytime I got in, a, in the water or went somewhere where there was a risk of me losing it, I would often take it off. And so I had this whole habit of taking it off and putting it in my wallet. And so it worked great. And so one day, um, we went to the beach, and I went with my wife, Meredith, and um, I asked her if she wanted me to take her ring because I was anxious about my ring, so I was also somewhat anxious about her ring because the whole thing was, you know, we had a lot of money in these rings when you're young and married. And you're concerned about losing them. And so, um, so she's like, fine. So she puts her wedding band in the, in, the, in the wallet with mine. And we go, we have our day at the beach. It's all fun and, fun and games. And we get back to the car, and I go, and she goes, can I have my ring back? And I open up the wallet, and her ring's gone. And what had happened was because her ring was significantly thinner than mine, it had slipped through the gap. And we had lost her wedding band. 
And I'm like freaking out. And she's like mad at me, rightly so, because this is my fault. Because she never had problems with rings falling off, you know, because she had it sized properly. And, you know, um, and so, man, you know, we, I just check every pocket, right, of everything I have. We're underneath the seat of the car. We retrace our steps out to the beach, you know, and you're thinking, of course, there's no way that you're going to find a ring in the sand. And sure, sure enough, we did not. We did not find it. And so, you know, we go home after probably an hour of looking around and just being, being <laughs> upset and angry, right? And, um, and then we just got over it, right? Of course not. You don't get over something like that. Because it's not, it's not just the fact that it was, you know, a three or $400 wedding band, which was a lot of money to us back then, still is a lot of money to just lose out there, right? Um, but it's not, it wasn't just that. It was the wedding band, you know, you, like that's, that's, it has special significance beyond just its, its material value. So, you know, I'm thinking about this for weeks. One weekend I was, I had a, this crazy idea. I started researching. It start, turns out, and it, you, maybe you know this, there's these clubs of guys that go out with uh, the, the um, metal detector guys. And you can, there's like message boards and you can tell them, hey, we lost this and this. And if you could find it, this is our address and all that stuff. I did all that. Nothing ever came back, right? And so, man, if you've ever been in that situation, you know, right, the, 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 there's a, supposed to be an emotional connection to this story, right? Um, for some of you that are financial, this will help, right? If you just think in your head, think up, just get in your number. That's a round number. On, like, don't go check your bank statements. But just figure out, like, okay, like, what's your net worth ballpark, right? Some of you are like, what's a net worth, Right? <laughs> Um, but like, like just imagine that number, like all, your, your retirement account, your bank account, your, your savings account, add it all up, okay? Now imagine that the value of that, you trade it in, and this is hard for us because money is always in digital form now, right? We never see it any, hardly anymore. But just, just imagine you traded every, all that value in for 10 coins, physical coins that you now had to store and keep safe and keep track of. What would you do with those 10 coins? How would you treat those 10 coins? There's a lot of debate. If you go online you, and search about the 10 coins parable, there's a lot of discussion online about what this value could have been. It was off, probably a drachma. A drachma was a coin that was about the value of a day's wages. Okay? So this is, this is how, how rough things were in the ancient world. This is probably this lady's life savings, which amounted to about $1,600 in our money. But imagine that's your net worth, right? That's your whole nest egg. That's the emergency fund. That's it. That's what you have saved up. Imagine 10% of that number, one of those coins that, it, that amounts to your entire net worth goes away. You had 10 grand and now you have 9 grand, right? You had 100,000 and now you have 90,000. You had 100 bucks and now you have 90. What happens to your heart in that moment, right? If you've ever, if you lost that, it doesn't matter. Yeah, you can go and you can make it again. You're never going to get over the loss of that, right? Like, you're never going to get over the loss of that ring. It's gone forever. And so this is the thing Jesus is communicating. Jesus never gets over the lost coin. Jesus never gets over the heart that walks away from him that's never restored to him. He searches with a sense of urgency. How, fast, how, how long do you think you would look for that coin that you lost, that that was your whole 10% of everything you had, right? You'd be just like this lady. It's a beautiful description, isn't it? You light a lamp and you sweep the house, and when you sweep the house and you can't find it, you sweep it again. And then you call a neighbor to come over and help you sweep the house, and you're not going to quit until you know for sure that it's gone and there's no recovering it. You know, and, and think about how wild it would be for somebody to show up to, you know, to, to my house someday and say, hey, we found that ring, right? We wouldn't even be able to tell if it really was the ring anymore. <laughs> it could have been anybody's ring. <laughs> but imagine the joy, right? That, and that's, that, that's, the, that's the ending point. He says, so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. But man, do we have that kind of urgency? 
Do we have that kind of urgency in our relationships with people who Jesus says are as valuable as a lost sheep or as valuable and as sought after and as and he's so that brokenhearted over that loss? It's that significant to him? Do we have that kind of care? I think it helps for us to understand to first put it in our own terms because we're naturally selfish people, right? Or we think about things in our own terminology, right? To think that that's the value that God placed on you. That that's the kind of urgency with which he sought, sought and continues to seek after you. And man, does that move the needle for us when we think about others. He values the loss, so we should too. The last, uh, the last uh, lesson is this one. Um, Jesus is a, this familiar parable, um, the prodigal son. Verse 11 says this. It says, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of, his prop- of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country, and he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have, had, have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. And ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, uh, father sa- <laughs> But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead. And is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. You know, sheep are valuable and were beloved by shepherds, right? Coins in their ancient world where they didn't have, you know, fidelity and they didn't have, you know, Bank of America to store their wealth for them and to keep it secure. Coins were a big deal. But none of that is even close to a son, right? And any of you that are parents can can attest to that. We just that's a that's an order of magnitude that's even it's it's even way beyond the value of these two things, right? And so there's this ratcheting up with each of these stories. And what Jesus is saying is the the the, the, sin, the, the, the tax collectors and the sinners that you Pharisees and scribes look at and say, why would you make, take time with those people? Don't you understand? Those, that's like my prodigal son. But here's the thing. The story, we often, um, we actually don't, uh, uh, we miss the idea that this is actually a story of two sons. Usually, it, when we hear about this story, we stop reading it right where I just stop reading it. But the meat of the story is actually the second half, the the last third. And Tim Keller wrote a whole book on this called The Prodigal Prodigal God. It's about not the prodigal son, who we all identify with because we all rebelled against God, right? And God took us back in his love and his compassion. But there's also an elder brother, the older brother. And so the scene cuts to him in verse 25. It says, now his older brother was in the field. And as, he came, uh, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. I always loved that scene, right? He's coming up over the hill, and he hears like the, 
the subwoofers going off, right? Like that house having a party in your neighborhood. Doom, 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 doom. What is going on down there, right? I didn't get an invite to a party. I've just been working all day, and I come home, and there's a party in my front yard. What is going on? And he called one of the servants and asked him what these things meant. What's going on down there? And he said to him, your brother's come home. Your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he received him back safe and sound. And he was angry and he refused to go in. And he was angry and he refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me a goat, a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. And when this son of yours comes, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, and you killed the fattened calf for him, Notice the distancing language. It's his brother, right? But that's not what he says. He says, this son of yours, I don't want anything to do with him. He's your problem, right? And he said to him, that is the father, right? Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad For this, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. So the father confronts the language, doesn't he? He says, he's not just my son. He's your brother. You are always with me, he says. But this, your brother, was lost, and now he is found. The generosity and the mercy of the father towards the younger brother was seen as an offense by the elder brother. He had been the one to put in the work and to do the right thing, and he felt, based on the treatment of the younger brother, now all of a sudden he thinks he's not been fairly treated. We have to remember how the passage started, right? The tax collectors and sinners were drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives people like that? Because remember, this prodigal son had not just left and gone off to college, you know. He had left and abandoned the family and sold everything that his father had spent years building and spent it on things that were shameful. He was the worst kind of person, right? Just like those sinners and tax collectors were in the minds of the Pharisees and the scribes, those deacons and Bible scholars, right? So what Jesus reveals through the parable is that the prodigal and the elder brother were both not in right relationship with God. They were both not in right relationship to the Father. The elder brother's spirit of hatred, and that's what it was, right? You can hear it revealed that he didn't share his father's heart. And here's the thing, guys. A heart for the lost is not something that God needs from us, but it is something he wants for us. He wants for us to see that we too are lost and we're found. And so why would we not share in God's heart for the lost? There's a prodigal son and an elder brother in each of us, right? And we will not fully embrace our call to reach the lost until we can deal with them both. Until we can both reconcile our need to go off and to do our own thing, right, and rebel against God with all kinds of sinful acts, or to sit and to dutifully do the right thing, but still be far from God. Both of those things. God's calling us away from to see, no, I love and I cherish and I value everyone that I made. 
I want you to be able to see that more clearly. I want you, Jesus is saying through this, to repent, not just of the sins. Because notice, he doesn't say that this, what the tax collectors and sinners are doing is okay. He describes them, he's connecting them through this story to this story of a prodigal son. He says, I'm, seeking, I'm hanging out with them, I'm eating with them because I'm seeking to bring them to repentance. But you guys are missing the point by showing up and grumbling. My, I'm here to seek and to save the lost, not just the lost that are out there partying on a Saturday night, but the lost people, the, the elder brothers who sit in the pews of churches and on, preach from the stages of churches every single Sunday morning. He came to seek and to save the lost. So we have to deal with that, the prodigal son and the elder brother in each of us. So as we go to the Lord and as we respond, let's ask him to do a work in our hearts. And Father, we... We know that your heart is for people and that your value, the value that you place on us is way more than we even place on us. Do you love us like a, a shepherd loves his sheep and, and you cherish us like the woman cherished her lost coin and and that you're heartbroken at every single one of us who's in that position of either the prodigal son or the elder brother. Because we, we don't have your heart yet. So Lord, I pray that you would place that in us, that you would help us to walk in your love, not just for ourselves, but, but for the people around us, that we would see them that we would be moved um, by your love to love others. In Jesus' name. Stay.